Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Alex Meyer, and I'm a software engineer at KubeCost. But uh, here this afternoon in my capacity uh, as an open cost maintainer and a maintainer of the open cost plugins project. So I was very excited to talk to you about open cost and some really exciting recent developments. Uh, first, we'll take a quick look at open cost pass, where it is today and where we're going at a high level. Uh, we'll sort of then sort of dig into the substance of the presentation, which is uh, open cost plugins. Uh, specifically how we use the focus spec, uh, a lot more on that later. We'll touch quickly on plugin functionality and delivery, how plugins work, and we'll peek under the hood a little bit, a demo of course, and uh, then we'll end the session with, with some road mapping and sort of goal setting here. But before we begin, uh, I couldn't resist the urge to sort of give my uh, perspective on Kubernetes at 10 years in the spirit of the festivities here. Uh, I've been working with Kate since early 2017, so you know, not there from the beginning, but you know, have seen a lot of changes. And uh, you know, my make, biggest takeaway is that Kubernetes really doesn't have to prove itself anymore, right? And, and this is sort of what we're seeing in a lot of the other keynote talks and things like that, um, where you know, I, I don't know about y'all, but like for me, I'm not getting what is Kubernetes so much when I tell people what I work with and what I do, and that's awesome, right? And uh, you know, various surveys, the CNCF survey that I cited, uh, is like 89% penetration, right? Most companies, at least the ones surveyed, are at least evaluating or using Kates in production. Uh, and you know, because it saves a lot of companies a lot of money, right, and it accelerates them, um, especially in the beginning, right? I remember the organization that I was with when I first discovered Kubernetes, right? We saw an order of magnitude reduction in our compute cost. Uh, but then what happened? Well, we took the savings and we grew, right, as an industry and in, as individual companies, right? So. I mean, come on, 10 years ago, right? We could never imagine the things we're doing here. So all of a sudden, right, we find our apps are getting expensive once more, right? And I sort of take an opinion here, and like, this is the Gartner hype cycle, right, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And uh, are we in the trough of disillusionment or some way in or out of that, right? Because all of a sudden, these new technologies are costing us a lot of money, right? Uh, I just summarize it as a way of, you know, welcome to day two, right? We are firmly, firmly uh, in day two here. And we have people asking, you know, what can we do about that? So uh, enter open cost, right? It's not necessarily a new, new project, right? Our initial commit was uh, in early 2019. And, you know, sort of I've broken this up into the top of the timeline of sort of social or milestone uh, events. And the bottom is sort of more technical stuff, right? Uh, so like we, you know, introduced a Helm chart, right? And, and uh, cloud costs, right? More recently, uh, Open Cost has now powered some of the cost functionality of AKS um, plugins, which we'll talk about. And you know what I love is the time it took for us to go from 3,000 to 5,000 stars is a lot shorter than 1,000 to 3,000, right? So you know, and you can see sort of on the right side of my timeline here, things are, things feel like they're picking up, right? Um, which, which is super exciting, right? Which brings us to today. Um, as the time that I got this stat, we were at 5,200-ish stars. Um, that was probably out of date an hour or two after I got it. Uh, and our big news, of course, for those of you who missed it, is we got promoted a few weeks ago to incubation status. Um, and, no, you know, so we're very excited about that. Um, open cost today has three main facets, if you will. Uh, our bread and butter is Kubernetes cost, right? Stuff like namespace costs, pod costs, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, more recently, cloud provider costs, right? So you integrate with your cloud provider, and we provide those costs to you as well. Um, our topic for today, which is most exciting to me these days is uh, any cost you can imagine, right? Uh, through open cost plugins. Um, you can access all these costs through you know, a powerful REST API. Um, and in fact, anecdotally, I think most of our users do leverage the API first, right? It's a very powerful data collection layer. And what we're sort of finding is happening is we're developing a really rich ecosystem of exporters into various formats, uh, plugins that are being developed. Uh, new data formats, right, and sort of new ways of doing business using this completely free and, and open source tool. So sort of what is our high level vision for you know, what we want out of open cost as a whole project, right? Uh, we would love to become the open standard for visualizing all of your cloud native spend, right? And when I say cloud native, I mean the technologies, right? Open cost has a large user base that's on prem, so you don't have to be on the internet to uh, you know, leverage this, right? You can be air gapped or, or however you run it, and with the end goal of like bringing vendors and customers together, right? The, our cloud native vendors, they don't want you to be surprised by your bill, right? They want you to, to get so much value out of that and feel confident in spending more and you know, doing 
wilder things, right? And the same thing that customers don't want to be surprised by bills. They don't want to think, oh, this service is expensive or, oh, we can't use this anymore. So we want to bring these two parties together and, you know, whose, honestly, motives are fundamentally aligned, right? But give them an open platform to which we can all sort of, you know, measure our costs, right? And make sure we're getting a good value for, for our resources. Um, eventually, right, the idea is to become a single pane of glass, right? To what extent that is and what that looks like, we you know, are looking to our community to help us set that vision, right? But we want it to be in one place, at least at one point, right? If it gets brought off into different BI tools or whatever, that's awesome. Uh, but we want to be that layer, right? Uh, for those of you who know, you know, cost and usage reports, right? We want to be your cur for the internet. And, uh, you know, regardless of the type of talk, uh, cost, provide that for you. Um, for those of you who are sort of in the FinOps world, I'm sorry I won't beat this to, to death here, but like this, there's this idea of unit economics, right? Where the nirvana of FinOps practices are that you don't look at your infrastructure like a cost center or something that is painful or you wanna avoid, right? You wanna look at it that, hey, for every $1 that I invest in my infrastructure, I get $2 in revenue out of, or you know, profit or whatever, right? And so that, is when you really unlock the power and, and sort of is the end game for what we're trying to enable our, our users with. So back to our sort of main topic of plugins, right? This is an effort that began at the beginning of 2024. Uh, and it's basically a community driven effort that we call measuring all the costs, right? This is a fundamental acknowledgement that we cannot build as the maintainers uh, or contributors, we cannot measure every cost that there is in the ecosystem, right? Uh, there are just, there's too many, it's always growing and changing. Uh, and so, you know, we could do Kubernetes certainly because you know, that's a sort of homogenous thing. Cloud costs too, to an extent, right? There are a few major players that we can get most of the, ca capture most of the market with. Uh, we don't stand a chance with third party costs. So from this get go, we knew that we needed to harness the power of the community. So the idea is that, you know, for your organization, if you have one outside cost that's driving most of your spend, you invest hopefully a limited amount of engineering time in developing a plugin for that cost, contribute it upstream. And then sort of in, res in uh, reciprocity, others contribute and you know, maybe you can leverage their work, right? And we begin to uh, congregate all these costs. So from the get-go, this was truly an exercise in open source design. So our biggest challenge that we identified in this paradigm, right, that was the interface, right? And you know, as we all know here, interfaces are always an important part of software development. But in general, right, if it's an internal project, you can all gather around a table and hash things out. And if there are questions, you can ask your colleagues questions. We don't really have that here, right? We're in the paradigm of we're all in different locations all over the world in different companies, right? So having a good interface is frankly an existential uh, risk here, right? And and. Again, back to this idea of harnessing the community power, like if we required everyone here to be an expert in open cost to contribute, we would be doomed, right? And not the least of which we would certainly get it in like architectural arguments, right? And people would have to become Go experts and all that sort of thing. Uh, ideally, right, then it's a black box. You write the plugins, you, you process the costs that you care about, you don't worry about the rest, right? You let the underlying infrastructure sort of homogenize that and, uh, you know, handle aggregation and everything like that. So, you know, this idea has been brewing uh, at, at KubeCost and in the open cost maintainers meetings for, for some time, right? But we had this, uh, this existential problem of, well, you know, we don't, we don't know the list of costs that everyone would want to, to implement, right? And how can we, you know, how can we predict in the future with any certainty of what people would want, right? Uh, and with any sort of reusability. And uh, so fortunately, uh, recently, we learned about the Focus spec. So this was released, I believe, earlier this year, Focus 1.0 spec. And what Focus stands for is the FinOps Open Cost and Usage Specification. So this is a uh, working group in the FinOps Foundation, right, which is also a Linux Foundation um, organization, so a sibling to the CNCF. And Focus uh, has their mission statement as, uh, Focus aims to establish a community-driven specification for consumption-based billing data. And that's great, right? Like that is, you know, very powerful and helps many reasons, not just for our own uh, and open cost, right? 
Um, I think primarily the FinOps folks focus is to enable their uh, FinOps practitioners right in their orgs to have a unified set of billing data to run the FinOps lifecycle. And again, that's a sort of a FinOps foundation term where it's like you're constantly evaluating and uh, optimizing your costs, right? And the, this specification serves as the input to that process. If I had to describe it in a few words, right, it is a set of billing fields that can describe an arbitrary cost. Uh, and for our specific needs, right, we were elated because, hey, we have our path forward, right? We have our interface. We do not have to guess uh, ourselves what people are looking for. And why are we so excited about this? Well, the focus spec is maintained by a dedicated working group, right, of many organizations that I sort of cited briefly on my last slide, right? Some of the largest companies in the world have uh, people that are either dedicated part or full time to maintaining this spec, right? And another benefit for us, again, as open source maintainers, right, the, fo the focus fields are all extremely well documented, right? We don't, we simply don't have the bandwidth to, uh, you know, explain in great detail because we honestly, you know, we aren't entire experts ourselves, right, about what is in every single field of this spec. So this sort of allows people to teach themselves about what is in the interface fields. And, you know, I have an example here that I took from the focus spec uh, web page here that's just an example of like build cost, right, one of our more important fields. And it has a, a extensive description, hyperlinks to specific terms, right, so that uh, contributors can teach themselves uh, what is going on here, what we're looking for. Um, and, you know, of course, typing always important, right? Uh, an extensive type interface. And finally, um, but certainly not least important, is versioning, right? So this organization will handle the version. This is a living spec, right? It's not this thing that's going to rot in an open cost branch if no one loves it on our team. Um, it's, it, it's its own living thing, and we can sort of follow, uh, follow in their wake if you will. So it's not perfect, right? I have here all the focus fields, and there are 43 of them, right? And I put this here because, you know, to just give you the impression of like, oh, well, that's a lot to do, right, if I want to contribute to open costs. And, you know, it's a pretty typical product of design by a working group, right? Works well enough for everybody, but it's not specific to any one vendor, so they have to sort of take the superset, right, of all the fields. Um, this presents a challenge, right, bringing us back to our paradigm and our use case of, look, we're asking basically people as acts of professional service to implement uh, these fields, right? And it's our job as the designers to make this as uh, unintimidating and, you know, and easy for people to use, right? Um, are what we are specifically trying to avoid, someone's saying, sure, I'll write a plugin. And then they get halfway down the list and it's like, oh, I don't have a, a cost for, you know, commitment discount ID. Guess I can't contribute it, right? And they abandon it, right? That is a, a categorical failure on the designer's part. So how do we address this? Well, we basically split the focus spec in two, okay? And we have two main components, what we call the core interface and then the extended interface. Um, these are protobuf fields, right? And we define them in protobuf. And essentially, our core interface is what we build the center of our experience around, right? These are the highest impact focus fields, your major costs, your labels, um, account name, stuff like that, that we can generally expect most like online SaaS services to provide, right? And this helps us that we can you know, cut down our UX design to this sort of core set of fields. Um, the, these core custom costs have a pointer in the protobuf struct now that points to the item on the, the right, which is the extended cost. So these are the uh, less commonly available fields, things like committed discounts, right? Like that only makes sense in certain contexts, right? Charge frequency, SKU price IDs, right? Like we don't see these so often. Now, you know, of course, if your cost supplier implements the focus spec, then you will have these, but that is very much the exception uh, at this time. And the key thing here is both of these interfaces combine to fully meet the Focus uh, 1.0 spec. Just a sequence diagram here on how plugins themselves work. Um, basically, the open cost, the custom cost ingester at left here gets a list of all the plugins. And then for each plugin that is configured and installed, 
it sends a custom cost request protobuf object, which contains essentially two things. The window that we are looking for costs for, uh, and then the resolution that we are asking for costs for. And again, we don't expect all plugins to be able to support both of our daily and hourly resolutions. So we, uh, you know, again, do a best effort. Um, that's sent over gRPC via a tool called Go Plugin. It's a Go package that uh, is from HashiCorp. And the power of this is that um, using gRPC and Go Plugin is that you can actually write your plugins in any language that you'd like, as long as it supports gRPC and can be executed, of course, right? So that means that, you know, all of our plugins right now are in Go. That is not a constraint, right? If a certain API client is only available in another language, Rust or something, like, that's great, right? Um, we're, we're, again, trying to meet people where they are and make this easy to contribute to, right? So the plugin gets this request from OpenCost and says, okay, you know, it wants these three days worth of costs at this resolution. Um, it makes vendor-specific requests, right? Again, that's sort of the substance of what the plugin implementer builds. And then it forms that data as best as it can into focus objects. And then that, that's sent back over uh, gRPC and ingested into OpenCost, and then we um, provide that, again, as part of our core APIs and everything like that. So the sort of the one last thing to hit on here in terms of architecture is the delivery method, right? So when you're compiling a Go plugin, there's a substantial amount of boilerplate, right, that goes into a Go binary. And we are finding that the plugins themselves approach the size of the open cost Go binary. So it's not really a scalable solution, especially if we're trying to encourage many plugins to be built to ship everyone with open cost, right? We would be looking at very large containers very quickly. So the way we work around this is in GitHub, uh, when you merge your plugin, it's compiled for um, you know, three architectures, ARM, AMD, and then Mac OS, and uh, pushed to GitHub releases, right? When you boot your open cost pod and it detects that you are trying to use plugins, it in boots in a NIC container that either fetches a specific version from GitHub if you want a specific version, otherwise the latest, right? That's stored in an empty, uh, empty dir volume, and then it's ready to be consumed by open cost itself. So we'll, we rely on the init container to handle things like architecture, version, and you know, to follow whatever uh, internet sort of things to, to deliver the plugin. So with that being said, let's, go, let's see it in action. So here I have an open cost installation uh, running on, on our dev cluster at KubeCost. And just by way of a quick tour here, right, this is our cost allocation view. So these, these are all namespace costs, right? So I want to zoom in a bit, actually. But we have, uh, you know, per namespace costs here. And, you know, we, we support a whole bunch of different Kubernetes aggregations. Again, those of you who are using open cost, nothing, you know, this is open cost bread and butter. You've been using this for, for a while. A little bit newer are our cloud costs, okay? So these were introduced about a year ago, and this integrates with multiple cloud providers. So here we have you know, an AWS and a GCP connection, basically, right? This UI features drill down, so where you can start to dig into other costs, and you know, some of our, your costs are related to Kubernetes, Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine, obviously, but there's stuff like Cloud SQL, right, which doesn't have anything to do directly with your Kubernetes cluster, but again, we are just trying to centralize as many of your business's costs as we can in one location, right? Um, and again, you drill down far enough, right? You get to our maximum resolution, which is item, which is what we call item, and then you can view sort of per item um, cloud costs here, right? Again, this isn't new. I just am giving this as a quick uh, refresher for those of you who haven't seen this or haven't enabled this feature. What is new for this talk is uh, external costs, right? So this UI and the updated API are available as of open cost 1.113, which was released last week. And what we have here is uh, we have three plugins. So these are our released plugins that I'll be demoing today, which are Datadog, which is our reference, reference implementation and our oldest plugin. Uh, MongoDB, which was a contributed by a member of the community. So Sajid, if you're watching, thank you. And uh, the OpenAI plugin, which is what we built as part of our uh, work for, for this talk. So we do feature drill down here as well. So if I drill down into OpenAI, we go into account name, which we use the, the name of the AI, API token, right, which I just call personal. We then drill down into resource type. Again, not terribly interesting because OpenAI sells one type of resource, right, which is AI models, basically. But here, when we're at sort of maximum drill down, 
we get a little bit interest, more interesting of a view, right, which is where we can see different model costs. So what I'm driving this demo with is similar to OpenAI's uh, developer documentation. I'm just asking OpenAI to write me a haiku every 30 seconds with two different models, right? And so looking at this, right, it's, it's pretty interesting to see the difference between the two models, right? Like, again, these are firing API requests for the exact same prompt at the exact same frequency. We can see that their mini model is significantly cheaper than their GPT-4.0 model, right? And again, this is somewhat of a contrived example, but if your organization had a large spend with OpenAI and you see something like this, it's like, well, you know, maybe we want to investigate uh, GPT-4.0 mini since the full-blown model is such a significant part, uh, part of our spend. So the maximum, when you click the maximum drill down here, we basically, uh, and I'll zoom back out a bit, we, we print all of our sort of core focus fields here as our detail view, if you will. So we have our cost, and then we have our usage, which is number of tokens consumed. Sorry, that's low and hard to see, but um, we have our AI tokens consumed, and then you know we put a dimension on the unit, right? Backing out a little bit, um, we can view all of our costs sort of uh, aggregated together, right? And I'm not aggregating by provider, we call it domain. Um, this is just by the resource name, right? And I'll give it another zoom in so we can see. We can sort of start to see the, the power of this where, you know, between the three plugins, this is a Datadog cost, right? This is a MongoDB Atlas cost, and this is a OpenAI cost all together in the same sort of view, right? And you can, you know, sort the costs and everything like that. So you can begin to start to see where your biggest cost drivers are across everything that your organization consumes, not just Kate's or, or cloud providers, right? And you know, we, um, we support a bunch of different types of costs. So this is another um, thing that's probably worth calling out is we have a concept called the cost type. And what that is, is it can be either build or list costs, right? And we display both of them together in what we call a blended view. And this is, again, this is us trying to make it as easy as possible and as frictionless as possible to contribute here. Some APIs only provide usage and a list price. Some API, APIs only provide a build cost, right? We don't want someone to feel like they would not be making a good contribution if they didn't support one or the other. So by default, we have this blended view, right? Which is, the algorithm is, if we have the build cost available, we take that in since that generally incorporates any you know, discounts or volume discounts, stuff like that. Uh, but if that isn't available, we fall back to the list cost and we display those together, right? So some of these are lists, some of these are build. Um, we appreciate that this you know, isn't what everyone is looking for. So you can, of course, always just filter out to the um, build cost. So now we only have build costs in this view and likewise. We only have list costs otherwise in this view, right? So if, if you're only looking for that, you can sort of work around this functionality. One last thing that I uh, would love to point out is, and I'm gonna, we're gonna aggregate by provider again. Um, what we do is open cost continually gets the last seven days of costs on a rolling window. This is because similar to cloud providers, right? A cloud provider won't fully reconcile its costs until generally 48 hours after they're incurred incorporating discounts and everything like that. Um, these third-party services are no different, right? Datadog, for example, says uh, it can take up to 72 hours for them to get you all your costs. So rather than just say, what was yesterday's cost and move on, we get, the, we get continually the last seven days cost. So sort of as we zoom out in this view, right, we converge as a week comes to the actual uh, incurred cost. So you know what's coming next, right? A call to action, um, and I apologize, the AI started to fail on me here, and the skin color is all different on my little pig here, but if you are using you know, a SaaS cost that's driving a large part of your spend, and you wanna see it in open cost, you know, we'd, love to, we'd love for you to contribute that, right? Uh, you don't need to know a single thing about how open cost works, you don't know how to program, you don't need to know how to program in Go, um, and you know, we, we would love your plugins and we would love to work with you to you know, build this community-driven effort to measure all of the costs. Um, Cube cost is sort of sweetening the pot here for the first 10 plugins that are submitted. We'll get $1,000 from uh, my employer and a box of open cost swag when we do merge your plugin. And again, by way of encouragement, 
uh, the, this OpenAI plugin took me about two days to build. Um, granted, I, I have worked a lot in this space, right? But it took me a day to learn how the APIs work. So again, Leo, if you're watching, thank you for the help there. Um, and then another day of implementation and, and testing of the plugin. So it's not this huge onerous task. I do like to think that uh, some of our design decisions have borne fruit here um, and you know, definitely encourage the group to uh, have a go at it, right? Uh, sort of as we wind down here, I just wanted to set the roadmap for the plugins project specifically, right? Um, our first stage was sort of plugin launch, right? And that is basically everything that was demoed today. We have our reference plugin implementation, which is Datadog. Um, and we've also have an integration test harness. So we continually, on a nightly build, hit all of these third party providers and alert when one of them go out of sync, right? Because that's a big problem for third parties is, you know, they, they will update their, their APIs at any time as third parties are wont to do. Where I think we are right now in the uh, life cycle is called what we call ecosystem enrichment, right? And this goes back to our call to action is we have a number of plugins that we're targeting here and you know, we're sort of asking the community to help us build these and um, you know, in looking at building some more ourselves, right? So we're, we're trying to get breadth at this point. Next step for us is uh, supply chain improvement, things like si plug-in signatures, right? That's been, a, supply chain security has, has been a big topic and you know, we, we wanna be part of that as well. Um, the idea of an open cost heavy version has been floated for folks in air-gapped environments maybe uh, where it's a bigger container that does have all the plugins, right? Uh, that, that is totally a valid use case, um, so that all the plugins are just there and ready to be consumed. Right now, all the plugins release together, so uh, independent plugin versioning is definitely going to become uh, necessary uh, before too long. And then we would love to institute uh, an LTS support program uh, for our plugins as well. Looking a little further into the future, we want to use this plugin data to, again, provide our community with a more unified uh, cost experience, right? So focus, of course, was designed for the cloud providers themselves, right? So like our cloud costs could be merged with these, with these plugins, right? And that would be cool to have each provider be a plugin. That would be a lot lower friction, too, to onboarding new cloud providers, right? Because we support four cloud providers now. There are a lot more than that. Um, eventually, right, then you unify all of your costs, whether it's an EC2 instance or a Datadog cost, you sort of get this single pane of glass. Um, and then finally, looking further in the future, we sort of reserve this advanced aggregation, maybe using extended attributes to tease out new insights and things um, for people based on extended focus attributes uh, or even more of the core ones. Um, but we're sort of holding back on that one because we need to, uh, you know, see, get feedback from the community, right? And see what people like and don't like about it. So just to finish up here, uh, you know, I hope I've demonstrated that open cost is gaining momentum, right? Like people want to save on cost and uh, you know, we're getting a lot of traction. We want to build on this successful track record with open cost plugins, which is the newest element of open cost. Um, we've painstakingly designed this to make your contribution as easy as possible. Uh, as we talked about, we have support for open AI, Mongo and Datadog, right? And um, you know, just a quick note for any of those using cube costs, right? As a downstream project of open cost, we do read in the open data that is being collected through plugins and you know, that's available in cube costs. Um, I guess I personally expect to see more focus in my life. I certainly hope to see more focus costs uh, in, in my life as time goes on and as this standard sort of gains traction. And uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're definitely excited for what the future holds. I want to thank everyone. You know, time for questions, I think, a little bit of time. Otherwise, I will be at the CubeCost booth, and I would love to talk to you about it. Right, thank you.